Hi everybody, um, today I'm visiting the University of Oxford and I'm here to talk to Professor Tim Palmer about climate models. Um, Tim, on the weekend I read this article in the New York Times uh, that was titled How Scientists Got Climate Change So Wrong. And it was mostly about <coughs> weather extremes and said that climate change has been much more abrupt than climate scientists expected. And I was wondering if that's really the whole story, because I kind of remember that people were talking about tipping points and um, unstable equilibria already in the 80s. So I was a little bit surprised about this. Um, and I thought, maybe I should, <laughs> I should ask you what you think about this. Well, <clears throat> the first thing to say is it's kind of interesting that now... Um, for, for, for decades, having been attacked by the climate uh, skeptic stroke denier community that the models are somehow useless, um, now the attack is coming from the other side saying the models are somehow too, too conservative and not uh, telling us enough about the uh, extremes. Now, <clears throat> I guess there's a couple of points to make here. Um, the first thing is, from a scientific point of view, most of the focus of the model predictions has been of global mean temperature. And the reason for that is sort of, you know, because that's, to, you know, that's, that's the basic thing that increased carbon dioxide is doing to the, to the atmosphere. It's increasing the surface temperature. Um, and by measuring the, the global average of this, what you're actually doing is... is is measuring or predicting a quantity where the signal to noise is maxima, maximal. The signal being the effect of the carbon dioxide forcing that we're putting into the atmosphere and the noise being the uh, internal variability of climate, the fluctuations that really have nothing to do with increasing levels of CO2 but just arise from the, the natural chaotic variability of the atmosphere. So when we go on to global scales this the chaotic variability is actually at a minimum and the impact of the CO2 forcing is at a maximum. So from a, from a science point of view, that actually is a very kind of robust indicator of how carbon dioxide is changing the climate. It's, it's warming the global temperature. And actually, I would say that the models from the 20th century through to the present day have been remarkably accurate in predicting the rise in global temperature. So from that point of view, I don't, uh, I don't think the models have been, you know, uh, underestimating uh, the uh, effect of carbon dioxide on global warming. However, when we come to talk about more regional extremes, so things like particular heat waves could be over Europe or United States, or you know, flooding events, or intense um, hurricanes or tropical cyclones, or indeed, as you say, kind of tipping point types of phenomena, then you're dealing with a situation where the internal variability of the atmosphere is much greater, um, and the signal, <clears throat> therefore, relatively speaking, is smaller. So it becomes a more difficult uh, statistical exercise. But on the other hand, this is exactly what people want to know. I mean, nobody physically is affected by global mean temperature, but they are affected by extremes of weather. Um, and I think basically what this is, the article is, is correctly pointing to, is the need, you know, now we've established beyond doubt, I would say, that uh, humankind is warming the, the planet. Um, we need to think in much more detail and much more, um, you know, much more accuracy um, what this implies for regional extremes of temp or regional extremes of weather and climate. So there are two issues here. One is, you know, one is is developing this the sort of statistical techniques where we can be confident in saying that such and such a, a, a weather event or a climatic event had a had an anthropogenic if, in, had an anthropogenic component. In other words, part of it was due to the fact that we are increasing CO2 levels. Um, but it also puts a very much an onus on climate models to be able to simulate these extremes well. And actually, that's an area where I think we can still improve things considerably.
So I think that the article, I think it got a, it it, uh, it it sort of exaggerated some aspects of the issue, particularly in relation to global mean temperature. But it correctly drew attention to the fact that we do need to focus much more um, on our ability to simulate and predict and assess how extremes of weather and climate are being affected by uh, climate change forcing. So <coughs> speaking about um, the quality of the predictions, um, you told me something about this figure 9.8 in the IPCC report. And this took me forever <coughs> to understand, but I will, I will try to summarize what's in the figure and then you tell me if that's, if that's about uh, correct. So um, what you see in the figure is the temperature anomaly um, for a period of years. And so the temperature anomaly is the, it's the global temperature basically up to a reference value. And this reference value on this figure is, is in the yellow region, um, which is from the years 61 to 1990. And so all the thin squiggly lines are the predictions from the different models. And the red line is the average from the models. And the three black lines are the data from different organizations. And uh, so what I, what I didn't understand forever Well, just to correct you, it's not the data from different organizations. It's how different organizations analyze the data, to, you know, the, the, yeah. the, the common data sets to produce estimates of global temperature. Yeah, uh, so, so what, what I didn't understand forever was uh, what's this little bar on the right side where it says mean temperature. So that's the actual temperature, the absolute temperature that um, these models predict in this region from 61 to 1990. So basically it tells you that the spread in the, in the absolute temperatures is much larger than the uncertainty, you know, the little squiggles uh, in these models in, in the whole region uh, where they have data, right? So I think what this figure tells us is that the models all agree that there is a certain trend, you know, um, looks pretty good, you know, uh, in, in terms of um, forecasting. Um, but it also tells me that, um, you know, the models have some difficulty getting the absolute temperatures right. Yeah, I, I, um, it, 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 it just highlights the fact. I think, I think perhaps it might be worth backing off a bit here and saying that these models are attempts to represent the climate of the Earth from pretty much first principles, you know, from the basic laws of physics. So from Newton's laws of motion, as expressed in, you know, the, what are called the Navier-Stokes equations of fluid mechanics, um, to equations which basically represent the laws of thermodynamics in a, in a sort of, uh, in terms of differential equations, um, coupled together with laws which express more quantum mechanical laws, which express how uh, photons from the sun are absorbed by different um, molecules and so on in the atmosphere. Uh, and re-radiated back to space uh, with, in, in the infrared. So these are all very basic um, um, sort of equations. They're not, you know, it's not that we're just kind of guessing empirically how we think the, the, the world works, you know, by just sort of drawing equ equations out of a hat and putting them into a computer. These are the basic laws of physics. Now, if you look at it from that point of view, um, Trying to get exactly the right, you know, to simulate exactly the right surface temperature of the Earth, which you have to remember, you know, over the oceans, um, the surface temperature is, is a, a very sort of complicated balance between, you know, regions of or where, the, where the, the ocean is, uh, ocean water is sinking and other areas where it's rising to the surface and regions where the sun uh, warms the surface, other regions where, you know, you're under cloud and there's very little sun. So getting the surface temperature not only requires, for example, getting the dynamics of the ocean right, it requires getting all that cloud cover right in the right place. So it's a really, really, really complicated uh, and difficult thing to get right. That's the first thing to say. And the little bar on the right-hand side is just pointing out 
that actually, you know, it's, it's a kind of manifestation of, of that problem because the range of estimates of global mean temperature from the models actually range over a few degrees, um, which, is, which is much larger than this trend in temperature that we've seen uh, over the last, um, you know, 60, 70 years or so. Um, now, I don't think this particularly undermines, well, it doesn't undermine the projections of global temperature. It doesn't, it doesn't, I don't think it casts any doubt that the trends in, in temperature that we've seen over the, the last uh, 70 years are indeed directly associated with human um, emission of carbon dioxide. But what it indicates is that, you know, we still have some way to go um, before we can say we have simulated the climate system to the extent that you really can't tell now. If I, you know, if I show you output from a climate model, you can't tell whether you're looking at a model or the real world. We still have some way to go to do that. Um, and that particularly, becomes particularly important more at the regional level. Um, for example, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about tipping points, and these are these are kind of what you might call very non-linear transitions, sudden transitions in the in the climate system. Getting these right actually does depend on getting the actual absolute values of temperature right. So, for example, if you take the melting of, you know, I mean, there's a concern that the melting of Greenland ice and actually the sort of disintegration of the Greenland ice core caused by, you know, the lubrication of the surface, the bedrock from, from melting water. I mean, that requires models to get the absolute, the, the temperature right, because water, fresh water at least, freezes at zero degrees. So if you have a two degree bias or something, I mean, that, you're going to get that process wrong. Um, another example is, is possible tipping points for the biosphere, where you know, either due to heat or, or, or a combination of heat and, and, and availability of, of, of moisture, of rainfall, you know, a forest can suddenly become no longer self-sustaining and will collapse. But again, that, to be able to model that requires getting these temperatures and rainfall amounts not right in a kind of anomalous sense, but getting right absolutely. And all that, I think that what that bar on the right-hand side, I don't think it should make us doubt at all that the temperature is warming due to CO2. But what, it, what it's indicative of is the fact that we, you know, particularly now as climate really starts to become an important societal issue, we've got to step up a gear in getting our models bias free. Yeah, so, so this bar on the right side, this was one of the things that I didn't really understand about this figure. The other thing is that I find it peculiar um, that you have the prediction from these models, but the predictions don't have any uncertainty um, attached to them, which is what, what I would expect would be the output of such a model. So my understanding is that the, the figure that for, for the projection of the increase in temperature or until um, the year... 2100 or something in the IPCC report. Um, it has an uncertainty and that's basically the spread in the predictions from the different models, not actually the uncertainty from the models. Okay, I mean, um, so the first thing to say is that the, the whole philosophy underlying the IPCC report is that it's, uh, it's an assessment of the you know, of the state of the art of climate science as, as determined by the peer-reviewed publications um, that exist at the time the report is written. Now, um, there are many climate institutes around the world, um, you know, typically, certainly virtually all of the bigger countries of the world have their own weather or climate institutes, and um, and they they have their own climate models. They might be they might be literally their own model produced by scientists uh, in house, or they might have taken the code from a, from another institution and, and maybe done some modifications. And you know, produced uh, produced 
results with that model. Now, many institutes do not have sufficient uh, computing resources to actually run the model itself in a kind of ensemble mode where they might produce, you know, 50 projections where you try to, um, by a number of different possible ways of representing uncertainty in the particularly the so-called subgrid parameterization. So that's the most uncertain part of, of climate models. You have to represent processes, cloud processes, perhaps the most important, are, uh, which are occurring on scales where, where the model can't resolve. The grid spacing between the grid points in the model is larger than the you know, a typical size of a cloud. I mean, many climate models have grid spacings of many tens, you know, maybe up to 100 kilometers, whereas individual clouds are just, you know, a few kilometers for the big ones at least. So that's so, 100 kilometers in the horizontal. In the horizontal, scale. sorry, in the horizontal, yes. It would be less in the vertical. Um, <clears throat> so m many climate institutes don't have the computational resources to, to try to explore the uncertainty in the, uh, you know, in the very, in the, in the subgrid parameterizations. So they would, they would typically just have one, one run, or one or two, let's say. Um, other, other institutes may have, may have multiple ensemble integrations where they do, I mean, the Met Office, the UK Met Office is a good example, where they produce very large ensembles of, of climate change integrations where they try to exactly do what you say, try to perturb the uncertain parts of the, of the models, uh, maybe using some kind of stochastic process, and then run these. But for these IPCC assessments, you know, to avoid being dominated by, you know, if, if one institute had 100 runs and the others only had one, you know, you'd be dominated by the centre which had 100. So I suppose... You know, a way of a way of dealing that with that is just to make the assumption that the ensemble of all of these different models is itself a reasonable representation of model uncertainty. Now, you can argue whether that's true or not, and I would argue certainly on the again coming down to the regional scale, that's probably not a good assumption. Um, but I think for these global mean temperatures, it's not a bad assumption. So what do you think are the main reasons that the predictions from the different models um, diverge? Well, there'll be a little bit of divergence from chaos, if you like, that, you know, if you just started them from infinitesimally different initial, start, uh, initial starting conditions, the butterfly effect will actually produce a, um, a, a, a certain amount of spread. But that's probably not the, that isn't really the major um, contribution to uncertainty. It comes from the uncertainty in, in how to represent processes which you know are important for climate, but where you don't have the computational resources to resolve them. So you have to parameterize, to use the, the jargon, parameterize these subgrid processes with very simple relatively simple anyway, formulae, which, uh, you know, which, and then, uh, so you have a, a closure formula. So there is a basic assumption somewhere where you would say, okay, um, if I know the temperature in a grid box and I know the humidity in the grid box and, you know, maybe some other variables, the wind and so on, um, I can predict in a bulk sense what the cloud, the amount of cloud in that grid box, you know, whether it'll be completely cloud free or completely cloud covered or, you know, 50-50 or something like that, half covered and half grid. So, so there'd be a formula which would be based on these, um, these resolved scale variables. Now, you know, in reality, there isn't such a formula. You know, it's not like nature, you can't go up and, um, you know, read a, a textbook on physics and discover what that formula is, because there is no formula like that. So different groups may come up with different formulae, different uh, closure schemes. Um, 
for you know for for various reasons they they may have some data sets which other groups don't have which maybe supports their formula or whatever it is i mean my own view is that um the only way to deal with this objectively is to express all of these subclosure schemes in a stochastic way using kind of some ideas of of random variables and just acknowledge um that that's that actually, from a, from a basic physics point of view, that is the best way to represent uh, uncertain processes. Um, but but in any case, the origin of the uncertainty is this subgrid, the subgrid parameterizations. And you know, of the, of all of them, the most important are cloud processes. But there's also other things to do with you know how you represent um, topography, the mountains of the earth. You know, if you have a very sharp uh, flow that's blocking, um, sorry, if you have a very sharp uh, uh, barrier that's blocking some flow, the, the, the width of the barrier might actually be too small to represent with your grid, with your, grid uh, in your, with your finite grid. So you have to f try to represent that blocking effect in a, in a more approximate way. I mean, that's just one example. But, um, and the oceans, you know, the oceans have... Um, what are called uh, mesoscale eddies, which are really important for determining how strong currents like the Gulf Stream or the Kuroshio current in the Pacific are. But again, you know, modern day um, uh, climate models, the ocean, uh, the ocean part of these climate models is the, the resolution is, I mean, we're getting, starting to get, getting close to being able to resolve these types of ocean eddies, but we're not really there yet so they have to be parameterized and again that's a source of uncertainty so i guess this brings up the obvious question what can be done about it well you see the 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 issue you know the the interesting thing from my point of view is that um climate has sort of gone in the last few years from something that i mean it's always been potentially of societal concern but I think a lot of um, a lot of scientists felt that although you know the, the 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 societal concerns were important in a way that the, the the tools that they had were, if you like, primarily being used for scientific research to really understand. Um, you know, the way in which, for example, CO2, in, enhanced uh, CO2 emissions would impact on uh, different parts of the climate system. It, it was, uh, it was a, um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a scientific endeavor. But what's literally happened, you know, in the last year or two is that it's suddenly become this incredibly pressing um, societal issue. You know, we're seeing all around the world um, these quite devastating weather events which are, you know, affecting people's lives. And society has got to know um, what can they expect in the future and how can they better prepare for the future? Um, what sorts of, you know, buildings do we need to withstand these extremes? Where should we be living to withstand these extremes? You know, can the can the human body actually literally exist uh, in parts of the world where temperatures and humidities become once they reach a certain level? So it's kind of gone from a, a, a you know a societally important but but fundamentally scientific question to one that really is societally crucial. And I think therefore, as a result of that, we've got to think much more in a much more pressing way about making these models um, fully realistic and accurate and really trying to eliminate where possible these, these parameterizations which just are just too approximate. And we know in a way the, the, the bottom line is the resolution of the model. In other words, the, the spacing between the grid points. That's what, you know, that's having... Uh, Having these grid spacings of many tens or hundreds of kilometers means that many of these important processes, key types of cloud processes, ocean, ocean mesoscale eddies, the flow over orography, topography, whatever. You 
we call it, um, have to be parameterized. We know if we can get the grid down to, say, about one kilometer globally, um, th then we can eliminate not all parameterizations, but probably the most important ones. And I, I feel, given this new sort of urgency to try to um, be able to answer questions which governments around the world and, and individuals around the world are asking about, and the, and the New York Times article drew attention to, about extremes. How, you know, how, um, I mean, we, you know, this week, for example, in the UK, um, there was considerable flooding uh, in, in an area near Doncaster. Um, hundreds of people had to leave their, their houses. I mean, that's the kind of key question a government wants to know. How much more frequent will that type of situation occur uh, in the future? Uh, the, you know, the poor people that suffered uh, in Mozambique under these tropical, enormously powerful tropical cyclones, again, want to know how much more frequent are these unbelievably intense tropical cyclones going to be. So we've got to develop models where these biases and so on, you know, are eliminated. And we can do that in principle, but uh, like all scientific big projects, it requires a certain amount of, of investment and it's primarily investment in supercomputing. It's to do with supercomputing. So, you know, I would certainly agree with it that this is information that um, we need. Um, so I find it a little bit ironic that um, I keep hearing that the science is basically done. Um, so I, I have another quote which I found in The Guardian um, in an article that appeared last week. It says, for ordinary citizens, it is important to recognize that scientists have done their job. It is up to us to force our leaders to act upon what we know. Okay, I mean, that particular quote was, I think, referring to the issue of trying to cut our emissions of carbon dioxide. I would agree, I think, more or less with that quote, if all that we were talking about was, do we have enough evidence to... Uh, make a decision about cutting our carbon emissions. Um, because in a way, you know, it's like every decision you make in life, you don't necessarily have to know exactly what's going to happen to make that decision. You have to, you have to know the threat that you're facing and whether the decision is justified given that threat. Now, the one thing that, you know, climate models are, have been quite uh, unequivocal about um, <clears throat> is actually that as we, um, if we, if we continue to emit uh, CO2 as we, ha as we are doing now and as we have done, then <clears throat> by 2100, although we can say that, you know, the most likely amount of global warming might be you know, might be maybe three or four degrees. We know from these ensembles of integrations that there is a tail which goes out to more than that. It could go out to six or seven or, or even more than that degrees. Now, again, six or seven, I don't know if that sounds a lot, but for, for anyone who knows their climatology, that really is catastrophic. So, you know, I mean, I, as a scientist, don't want to be, I don't want to say that... Um, you know, that means that we must uh, cut our emissions immediately because that's a political statement. But I think the politicians in principle have, that, have enough information uh, to, to make that decision. So the, the fact there is this threat, this risk, not only of, you know, very undesirable levels of climate change, but actually, you know, catastrophic levels of climate change, um, the risk is quite clear. And the only way to reduce that risk uh, is to reduce our emissions. So from that point of view, I agree with the statement, but to say that the, the science is, is kind of all done and, and dusted and, and the scientists are not needed anymore, um, misses the, you know, the other aspect of the problem, which is that, you know, even if we cut our emissions to zero tomorrow, we've already put into the climate system a certain amount of climate change that will continue. Now, we're not going to cut our emissions tomorrow. We're going to carry on for sure for many decades to come. Um, and so we are faced with a changing climate and we are faced with decisions 
on how to make um, society more resilient to that uh, changing climate. And I think nowhere is that more important than in the developing world, who, after all, have had absolutely nothing to do with this problem. I mean, they have not caused it in the most minute way. Um, but in a way, they're, suff- they, they're likely to suffer the most, either from extreme levels of, of drought um, to these really occasional but exceptionally damaging storms, um, or to levels of, you know, as I was saying to you earlier, to periods where temperatures and humidities could get so high collectively that the human body can no longer lose heat, either by sweating or any other means. So, you know, then that becomes an existential threat. So... That's the sort of what we've got to be do better, I think, in quantifying. And, and that, that puts very much the onus of climate change at the regional level, not just on the global mean temperature. Um, you know, my own view is that um, this is a little bit like, you know, the, the, um, the famous Marshall Plan uh, for bailing out Europe after the Second World War, where um, the, U- the US pumped you know, large amounts of money into stimulating the European climate, uh, the European economy. Um, not particularly for an altruistic reason, but because they feared the spread of communism and they wanted to stop that. Now, you could very much view that the, the whole uh, investment in climate adaptation in the developing world could similarly be viewed at a very, uh, you know, self-interested level in the sense that we're already seeing, you know, migration, you know, in Europe from Africa and the Middle East, uh, in the United States from Central America and South America. And there are certainly aspects of climate change in the reasons why people are migrating. Now, this is potentially nothing compared to what it could be like, you know, in, in later in this century. And so I think a kind of modern day Marshall Plan by the developed world to try to make life just more bearable uh, in the in developing world would, would you know, like, like the Marshall Plan to stop communism, this would be to try to keep people in place and say, actually, you know, living where you are is not so bad. Um, but if it becomes unbearable, then, then the trickle of migration that we're seeing now will become a, f- a, a, a torrent. And... Um, so that's, that's where, again, I think um, the climate uh, science is not done and dusted because we don't yet have a good and, I would say, reliable picture of how these extremes of climate um, at the regional level are changing and whether, for example, um, these tipping points, as they're called colloquially, but these kind of sudden, uh, r- rapid um, changes in climate which cannot be reversed. I mean, that's the key point about tipping point. You can't reverse it. Once it's flipped into this new state, it's, it's irreversible. This, by the way, has, this, this, this is actually where, this actually has a, a, a kind of a feedback into this question of emissions reduction because um, there's certainly a body of political thought which says, um, well, cutting our carbon emissions today is really, really difficult for various political reasons. But we don't have to worry, because in 50 years' time, we'll have developed the technology which will enable us to suck the CO2 out. You know, we'll, we'll suck it out of the atmosphere and dump it underground. And so we don't, we don't have to be too... Um, kind of aggressive in our emissions cuts today, because that will be a technology that will be there in the future, which will help us. Now, the point about that is, if in that period before, before the technology has been developed, if it ever can be developed, which is a major question mark, I would say, if we have undergone these tipping points, for example, in Greenland ice or some of the biosphere, or indeed ocean, some ocean dynamics might potentially have that ca- capability, then you've gone to a state that you can't reverse. So sucking the CO2 out of the air once the tipping point's happened won't do any good at all. You're not going to recover back to where you were. So again, that's an area actually where I'm slightly contradicting myself because I was saying that we perhaps need all, we, we, we have as much knowledge as we need to put into place emissions cuts. But I think the question about whether 
we can delay emissions in the hope that sort of the, the, the sucking it out of the air at some future stage will occur. That's going to be totally ineffective if we actually have crossed some of these tipping point things. And that's much, that requires knowledge of the climate system at that much more regional level and also at a much more detailed level because tipping points inevitably involve quite non-linear processes which are, which are hard to you know, simulate accurately and, uh, and that's where you need good models. I think that's a good place to stop. Uh, thank mm. you for your time. Oh. Thanks everybody for watching. See you again next week.